On Rescue 911, when two girls are suddenly struck in a go-kart by a speeding truck, their only hope for survival is their caring neighbors. I just didn't feel that we could stand there and watch a little girl die without giving her every opportunity to live. Then on the next Rescue 911. We begin on March 4th, 1988, in Littleburn, Georgia, a quiet community that's always given Wendy Fisher and her family a sense of security. It was a school day. It was a Friday afternoon. Tristan and Angie had gone upstairs and changed and everything, and they were going out to ride the go-kart. The girls had wanted a go-kart for a while, so my parents got them the go-kart. It was kind of the thing that year. There were a lot of kids in the neighborhood that had gotten go-karts. And since our neighborhood just has one entrance into it, there's not always a lot of traffic. They always had to wear helmets, and they had a little flag that stuck on the back. You know, it would be up pretty high so that cars could see them. Pam Williams and a friend were at a nearby tennis court. As we were playing tennis, we noticed the go-kart in the woods. They were darting back and forth, and they came into our field of vision several different times while we were playing. Trista was showing me where the start hill was, where we were going to jump over it. But I was real scared to go over that hill because I was afraid that I would fall off the um, go-kart. So Trista said, okay, I'll do it by myself. You know, I felt real stupid being by myself, and I wanted to be, if she was going to do it, I was going to do it. So I got on it. When we continue. I felt that if we moved her, she'd probably die. I also felt that if we didn't move her, she would die. Not breathing. Every day, all across America, unsung heroes are on the scene, saving lives. Witness courage and compassion in action. Paramedics, next on Discovery Health Channel. When a pickup truck slammed into a go-kart carrying 11-year-old Trista Fisher and her friend Angie, a neighbor heard the crash and immediately called for help. The call to 911 sent rescue units from the Gwinnett County Fire Department to the scene. Neighbor Bob Burns drove over to see if anyone had been hurt. When I could make it out that it was a go-kart, then I put two and two together, and I, I figured out that it, it was Trista. I didn't see him. I thought I missed him. The first thing I did was I took her pulse, and I couldn't find a pulse in her arm. There's a little pulse there. Then I looked to breathing. see if she was breathing, and she wasn't breathing. So then I took note of my wristwatch, because I knew that if she wasn't breathing, we had about four minutes that we had to make sure she got oxygen within that period of time. 
Pam and her tennis partner, who was a nurse, ran to help. Angie was trapped behind Trista, and Angie was conscious, and she was very frightened, um, a little bit panicky, probably, and she was trying to get Trista off of her. Linda Anderson recognized Trista because she knew the girl's mother. Are you all right? Her neck was flopped forward, similar to a doll whose head is broken. No, she's not breathing. We may have to move the truck. I am an RN, and there's another RN on the scene. We debated about whether to move Trista at all, knowing that the number one rule is don't move a victim. But the bottom line was Trista was not breathing. So still watching my watch, it got to be about 2 minutes and 45 seconds. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if we've got to do something, we've got to start it now. It's cutting into her neck. At that point in time, I talked to the driver at the truck, truck again, and I said, we're going to have to back up this truck. Okay? And I said, you back it up very carefully and make sure you don't go forward. And when you back it up, I'm going to try and lift the bumper a little bit just to clear the helmet that Trista had on to make sure that the bumper doesn't drag her head back. OK. OK, go back. Lift, guys. Come on, lift it up. Back, back a little more. That's good. That's okay, good. Okay, that's good. I went back to Trista, and I picked up Trista's head. It was laying over. I picked it up straight, and I said, we're going to hold this head straight, and we're going to make sure that there's no tension or pressure on her spine, because I'm afraid that there's a neck injury. One, two, three. Okay. Easy. Okay. Got it. I felt... Uh, that if we moved her, she'd probably die. I also felt that if we didn't move her, she would die. I just didn't feel that we could stand there and watch the little girl die without giving her every opportunity to live, even as slim as that opportunity might seem to be. Do you see her chest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting some movement here now. I prepared myself to do cardiac massage, thinking that her heart might stop as well. The strength of her heartbeat was fading quickly. Tonight, gunshot victims, drunk drivers, domestic disputes. The staff at Las Vegas University Medical Center tries to pick up the pieces. Don't miss an all-new trauma, life in the ER. Tonight on Discovery Health Channel. The accident had occurred just a block and a half from Trista's house. Her mother, Wendy, got there within minutes. Her color was just kind of a grayish color, and I was just kind of at her head end, and I was just saying, you know, this is mom, you're going to be okay. Mommy's right here. It was just a real hard, you know, to go through. When the first rescue units arrived, paramedic Greg Long took charge at the scene. We were. Assuming the worst as we were en route to the car. What happened across the street? I didn't see her. I, I didn't know I hit her. It was relief to have them take over. It just was becoming so clear that we were in a really tragic situation and we were so afraid of her dying. I need some cricoid pressure right here. Push down a second. Trista wasn't moving a lot of air. She was breathing about nine times a minute, which was not good for a child her age. She wasn't breathing enough. Oh my gosh, stethoscope. So we opened her airway, and at that point, I elected to put an endotracheal tube and began to breathe for her. Started a hyperventilator, really. What's the ETA on life flight? 15 minutes. Okay. In Trista's case, it was a little odd because normally everybody we ever pick up gets a cervical collar. Well, for some reason, a little voice that was inside me said, don't put a cervical collar on this patient. And I usually go with a little voice. I've been a paramedic for 13 years, and I've learned to rely on it. A life flight helicopter transported Trista the 17 miles to Eggleston Children's Hospital. I wasn't able to ride in the helicopter with her, and um, I had no idea where Eggleston Hospital was, and it seemed to take forever to get there, which is about maybe 30 minutes from here, but it seemed like eternity getting there. The hospital had already been alerted. A trauma team was waiting to examine Trista the moment she arrived. She's She's Orthopedic surgeon Thomas Whitesize was also called in. One, two, 
the situation that Trista was in was extremely precarious. She was near death. Small. An x-ray of her neck showed that her head had been pulled loose from her neck. She was given a bone graft in her neck and put in a halo cast to give it a chance to heal. They couldn't tell us, you know, how she would be or anything because he had never seen anybody survive an injury like this. For Trista's father, the accident was also devastating. You look for the best you can out of the situation. We were informed that she didn't have any movement on her left side and that she would be paralyzed on the left side. She's going to survive. That's certainly the good news. Now you progress from there. The next area, of course, is what's going to happen to her quality of life. Two and a half years have passed. Trista has, has come a long way since the accident occurred. She's uh, progressing, of course, much better than the initial prognosis indicated, the fact that she would be paralyzed if she made it through. And uh, to see her walking around now, laughing and riding her bicycle, and it's, uh, it's a miracle. She's a miracle child. She still attends special therapy sessions to improve both her vision and speech. I was really determined because before my accident, I was always, like, real active and stuff, and I didn't want to, like, be sitting around after my accident just doing nothing. So I was determined to be like I used to be. My goal is to, um, to keep improving until I'm satisfied. Trist is a survivor. She's always a doer. So I think the same energy that got her into the trouble in the beginning was also what was going to pull her through. And I believe that throughout the whole ordeal, that she is a survivor. She was our little miracle. Anybody that doesn't believe in miracles, there's one walking around in Gwinnett County today. Next. It was a very heavy traffic for that time of day, and it's very fast. I remember seeing a deer run across the freeway. So we all should take first aid and CPR courses every year. By learning basic life-saving techniques, we might be able to save the life of someone we love. This series is dedicated to all the men and women who answer our calls for help and are there when we need them most. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911. Next, step inside the command center where the calls for help are answered and meet the real-life heroes who save lives. Stay tuned for another episode of Rescue 911. Next on Discovery Health Channel. Real life. Medicine. Miracles. Mr. Shapiro, step out of the car, please.